All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, our Rutgers Cooperative Extension Earth Day at Home um, webinar series. This is our second uh, webinar series and we are so excited that you're all uh, with us tonight. Uh, we, uh, I'm here with uh, Bill Lubick and Bill and I, I'm uh, Michelle Bankus. Uh, Bill and I are both with Rutgers Cooperative Extension and Rutgers Cooperative Extension is the outreach arm of the university, of Rutgers University. And uh, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is a partnership between the state and the county. And we deliver research-based, science-based information to the public to help uh, the public uh, improve their lives, make their lives better, and do all sorts of extension programming. So. We have representation in every county in New Jersey, um, except for Hudson County, but we still do programming in, in Hudson County. And the purpose of this Earth Day at Home webinar series is to um, help folks learn during this time what they can be doing to protect the environment at home. Um, and, and during this time and after this time, so the idea is to give you small steps in different aspects of environmental protection, what the landscape care or wildlife management or energy uh, conservation to, to help for all of us to, to do our part to, to protect the, the environment. Uh, so, so a couple of things before we get started. Uh, we're using WebEx here and you are all muted. Uh, you are all muted, um, but you can ask questions in the chat box. So the uh, chat should be on the bottom right. So if you have questions, um, if you have questions, you can go ahead and ask them in the chat box, and we'll be delivering them to to Bill. Um, and then also, um, also uh, this recording is going to be available. This recording is going to be available on our web on our website on our Earth Day at Home website. Um, the recording from last week is available now. You can you can go and look at that. But if you just do a search for Rutgers Earth Day at Home, you'll be able to to, to see the, the recording. At the end of Bill's presentation, uh, we're also going to be doing a poll. So please stick around for our, our poll and our survey to let us know how we're doing with this. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bill Lubis, who is the county extension agent um, and professor with Rutgers uh, Cooperative Extension for Middlesex County. So he's going to be talking to you about earth-friendly lawn and landscape care. So take it away, Bill. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome to our series today. Today we're going to focus on how we can take better care of our lawns and landscapes and do it in a way where we um, uh, don't harm the environment and we take care of the beneficials that are in our, in our landscapes um, so let's get started. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Okay, so why do we have lawns? Well, lawns are very important because they help to tie the fabric of the entire landscape together. Um, as you're going to see throughout this presentation today, there are a lot of good reasons to have lawns, and lawns really help us to stabilize soil. So on many farms as an agricultural agent, I, I make recommendations to growers that around any waterways um, that we establish different types of grasses to help stabilize, to prevent erosion, and also to prevent nutrients and other materials from washing into uh, our irrigation ponds and lakes and streams. So grasses can form, a, 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 can actually have a very important purpose in the landscape and also on our production farms as well. They stabilize slopes, they help to prevent erosion, they can act as a fire break, they can actually, a little 50 by 50 area of lawn can produce enough oxygen for four people. Um, and they can also cool our environment because if you, if you didn't have grasses, um, temperatures can rise anywhere from five to 10 degrees or more in an area where you don't have some type of grass ground cover. Excellent. So grasses are very important to the natural environment. And this is a picture when I was up in Acadia not too many years ago, uh, one place that I absolutely love to go to. 
And you can see that the grasses where we have open areas, it's, it's one of the transitional species. Um, and grasses will come in as well as many other uh, wild species and different weeds come in. Uh, but they help to stabilize that landscape and then eventually other types of bushes and shrubs and trees move in, uh, you know, to take over that landscape. But they're one of our primary stabilizers of a terrestrial uh, system. So it's very important to have uh, lawns in that in our system. Next, next slide. A very important aspect to understand is the uh, ecology of landscape soils and what's involved, what we're trying to uh, do to stimulate healthy soil. So uh, when we look at soil chemistry and, and the microbes within soil, there's a lot of beneficial bacteria and fungi and actinomycetes and all these uh, organisms that actually help us to uh, transform nutrients to plants so that they become available uh, to many of the plant species we have in our landscape. So how do we keep these guys healthy? Well, we make sure that we adjust the pH, and we're going to talk about the importance of soil testing. Uh, by having the proper amount of organic matter, we can actually increase the health and the porosity and aeration and the, the overall dynamics of the soil so that we can keep our plants healthy, because there's an interrelationship between all these microorganisms um, helping to provide a better environment and nutrient availability for the plants that we grow. Next slide. So when we look at landscapes over the history of, of time, we, you know, we kind of fallen away, many people, from actually growing uh, types of plant material that are actually ideal for our landscapes, one of them being clover, white clover. And white clover is not necessarily a bad thing to have in your lawn because it's nitrogen. Um, it actually can capture nitrogen from the air and share it with the plants around it. So in some circumstances, um, we actually have people that incorporate uh, dwarf white clover into their lawns, and you can do that by adding, adding anywhere from two to eight ounces per thousand square foot uh, using uh, Dutch white clovers, and you can find those online. Um, so it's not a bad thing because the clover will actually break up compacted soils it'll provide nitrogen and share that with the grass plants around it. Typically, we'll have clover in many of our pasture grasses too. And the grass is actually protecting the clover because the clover does not like a lot of traffic, but it does help to break up those compacted soils, add nitrogen, but also enhances the, the microbial uh, content of the soil. So it's enhancing the different microbes that are gonna help us to have healthy trees and shrubs. And when we see other types of weeds, and they're the primary problem that we have in the landscape, usually means that we have compaction problems um, is the primary indicator if we have just weeds, and it's difficult for the grasses to grow. So if we can adjust the pH, usually we want to adjust the pH for most of our grasses and many of our landscape plants that are non ericaceous type plants to a pH about 6 to 6.5. And by doing that and by adjusting or relieving the compaction, and we'll show you how to do that later through core aeration, we can actually provide a better environment for grasses to grow. And if we don't correct those underlying conditions of compaction and low or high pH, then we're going to continually have weeds. So using pesticides at that point is not the answer. It may be a, a Band-Aid to put on there. It may work for a little while, but the long-term effect is that we really need to provide ideal conditions uh, for those plants. So by having, uh, you know, the right um, combination of organic matter and clover, we can really provide an ideal uh, environment uh, for the grass to grow. Any questions so far? No, not so far, Bill. Okay, next slide. If folks have, if folks have questions, they should go ahead and put them to, in the chat box. Next slide. Okay, so here's a good example of a landscape where a friend of mine, this is five minutes away from where I live here, and he actually redid the landscape and used a lot of plants that were really adapted to the conditions. So he, he didn't try to grow a lot of grass in this particular site because he was looking at the amount of shade he had, soil types. He, as you can see here, he used hostas and liriope. Uh, in those shade loving areas instead of trying to grow all, all grasses. So whenever you can plant grasses that are better adapted to your site conditions, 
uh, the right plant at right place, you're going to have much better success in trying to grow these plants that you're putting out there. Um, so that's why we always recommend that you start with a soil test. So if I were to do a soil test to this area off to the right here, I would simply take, you know, 12 to 15 cores, uh, take those cores, put them in a bucket, mix them up, dry those down, send them off to the Rutgers lab. Unfortunately, the Rutgers lab is not open right now, but when it does reopen, you'll be able to send your samples there. But in the meantime, you could just get a, a simple pH uh, paper or tester and test the pH because you want to try to bring that pH into the 6 to 6.5 range. Next slide. So this is a chart. It's a, it's a little bit fuzzy, so we'll make sure that we provide uh, this for you uh, on the website so that you can see it clearly. But it's just recommending some alternative native ground covers, uh, such as wild ginger, uh, Pennsylvania sedge gold star, uh, crested iris sun drops, moss pink, Jacob's ladder, and wild stone crop. And in a native setting, uh, we can actually grow these plants in place of typical lawns, and many people are very happy with these. The only problem with many of these native ground covers is unlike turf, we can't continually have traffic over those areas. So most of these plants are not going to uh, support traffic of kids running back and forth or animals running back and forth. So if we're trying to set up a low impact or low input landscape, we can incorporate some of these into our yard to try to increase the amount of lawn that we have, which is very important. You can jump onto our website to find out more information about each one of these varieties. Next slide. Sure, and yeah, we've had quite a few um, questions come in if you want to take them now. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so, um, uh, the first one is, and I think you'll be getting to this, you'll be talking about lawn thatch, right? Yes, I'm going to talk about thatch. Okay, so then we'll hold we'll that later. question until later. Um, and then uh, another question is, you'll, you'll probably be talking about this also, but which grass type is good for New Jersey and which ones um, should, they, should they not plant? Yeah, we're, gonna, we're actually going to talk about that under our lower maintenance grasses. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, and then um, another one is the plants that you mentioned here on this list, native ground covers, are any of them deer resistant? Um, deer resistant is a relative term, and let me tell you what that means. In our neck of the woods um, in Chesterfield, we have so many deer that nothing on any list is deer resistant. Uh, so it depends on where you're from. If you're from, I, I think somebody was from Wachung area. Um, Wachung area has such a high deer population and many of the areas state now. So the higher the deer population, even plants that we see are resistant or not resistant. Um, but generally, uh, these plants are not going to have a lot of deer resistance, these natives that you see here. Um, so sorry about that. That's okay. So there are a bunch of other questions, but I think you're going to be covering a lot of these things like um, soil testing and uh, um, ground covers and things like that. So, so we'll come back to some of these questions. Okay. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here you see there's a landscape where you see that the turf grass itself is actually adjusting on its own to lack of sunlight. So as we get into an area where we've got mid to full shade, grasses start to disappear. And that's just a clear indicator that, you know, we really can't uh, depend on, um, you know, if, we, if we're going to grow grass, we have to have full sun. And in areas where we don't have full sun, we're going to have a problem trying to grow grass. So as you can see here that uh, some of the fescues and a little bit of the bluegrass there will actually dissipate uh, when we're in an area uh, with, with almost full shade. But fortunately, there are many other types of plants like hostas and liriopes and many of the, the natives that I just showed you that will grow in, in some of these shadier areas. Um, but that's a real indicator there that, you know, if, if you have a full shade, you know, where you don't get any sunlight throughout the entire day, well, it's probably a good idea not to grow cool season turf grasses because they're going to struggle. Where you have partial shade, you can use fine fescues. And we'll talk about different types of fine fescue varieties that you can use. Next slide. Okay, so what part of the problem that we see in general is that um, 
people are often reaching for pesticides when they don't need a pesticide. Um, so what that means is that we really have to identify any problems that we have, you know, contact our local cooperative extension office to help us identify problems at hand and determine whether or not we even really need to take action. But we're going to, most of what we're going to talk about today is going to get you off of the, wean you off of the use of pesticides and get you focused on what you can do to help the landscape uh, stay healthy. Next slide. So where do these excess pesticides and fertilizers go? They can go into streams and rivers and ponds and groundwater and get into your drinking water. Um, so that's why it's so important for us not to fertilize near bodies of water to really keep a buffer zone of 15 to 20 feet or more of grass buffers. And that's typically what we try to do around most of our farm areas to protect soil from eroding and also to prevent the washing of, um, uh, of fertilizers and other contaminants into those waterways. Next slide. So one of the laws that we follow in New Jersey, of course, is the fertilizer law for nitrogen. So consumers are really not supposed to put more than 0.7 pounds of water-soluble nitrogen per thousand square foot. And we don't want to apply nitrogen at times before a heavy rain. Um, and we've really got to be careful about how much nitrogen we put down throughout the entire year. We really don't want to exceed more than 3.2 pounds of actual nitrogen per thousand square foot per year. Um, and we also want to avoid applying nitrogen between November 15th and March 1st because the grass is in a dormancy stage at that point. So it's not going to be able to adequately uh, take in those nutrients. Next slide. So how do we reduce fertilizer use? Well, one of the best ways to reduce fertilizer use is to recycle grass clippings back onto the lawn, which can provide between 30 and 50% of our nitrogen needs right back onto the lawn. Another thing that we can do very easily is top dress lawns with our own home compost that we create. You know, Michelle's gonna give a talk later in this series about composting. Um, we can also use compost and mulches around trees and shrubs to protect the root systems. One of the most sensitive parts of any plant is the root system. So if we can prevent those root systems from getting too cold or too hot, um, we can and we can also hold in moisture and recycle nutrients back to those roots. We can really reduce the overall amount of um, fertilizers that we need within that landscape. So the simple act of recycling clippings back onto the lawn it is a wonderful way to get nitrogen back onto the lawn, and it does not contribute to thatch. So remember that that grass clippings do not contribute to thatch. Next slide. So how do we reduce water use? Well, the best way to reduce water use within a landscape or water so that we can have nice, healthy plants is water deeply and infrequently. Um, focus your watering to early in the morning, especially with grasses. That way the water will penetrate down where the root system is and we don't have water sitting on the grass blades all evening long, which can also exacerbate any kind of disease problems that we might have. Um, another good thing to do, if we have perennial plants, we can use trickle irrigation on those within the landscape, uh, and that will conserve the amount of water that we're using. It can cut it by 70 or 80% or more by using trickle in areas where we have um, uh, uh, perennial plants. We're going to use it on lawns. Of course, we're going to use overhead irrigation on lawns, but we only want to water when we need to because most lawns only require about an inch and a half of water per week. And then around our trees and shrubs, we want to make sure that we're mulching with just two inches of mulch around those trees and shrubs. Uh, no more because we don't want to create these mulch volcanoes, which can actually suffocate those root systems. And in areas where we cannot get adequate irrigation out to areas, we want to select drought tolerant plants or grasses such as tall fescue, which is very adaptive, uh, has a very deep root system and can survive very well in areas where we can't get irrigation out to those areas. Next slide. Do you want to take some questions? Let's take sure, some yeah. Um, since you brought up watering, one of the questions was, uh, can watering at night cause disease? It can be if you uh, water in the early evening. Uh, if you water after 10 or 11 at night, typically most of our disease models show that if you water very late at night, you water first thing in the morning, that's really the best thing to do. And if, if you don't even want to think about it too much, just water super early in the morning so you don't lose moisture, it gets down to the roots. Um, because having that water sit on the grass all night long can actually increase the amount of uh, foliar diseases that we'll see on grasses. Any other questions? 
Yeah, so another one was just related back to um, fer fertilizer. Question was, um, uh, doesn't fertilizer get onto streets and into storm water, and does it also affect groundwater? Yes, it can. Um, so the idea would be to focus fertilizer uh, in the amounts we were talking about, so you're not putting more than 0 0.7 pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square foot. Um, any fertilizer that would run off into walkways or, or driveways, we want to make sure that we quickly sweep that up, put it back into a lawn area, and not over fertilize areas. And most of our fertilization should go down. We're going to put one or two fertilizers down. So the best idea is probably mid-September to late September to put an application down. If your grass looks uh, very weak, then we can put an application down this time of the year, but we wouldn't want to put any additional applications beyond that, especially if we're going low maintenance grasses, which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so um, adequate sunlight, critical for healthy turf grass. So that means that we need direct sunlight coming into many of these areas. Um, the more sunlight, the better for most of our cool season grasses. They will thrive uh, under full sun. Um, if we have partial shade, then we turn towards the fine fescues, and they do better under a little bit of shade. And even some of the tall fescues will do okay under uh, uh, partial shade. And, we, you know, for areas where, where we have uh, no sunlight coming in, we want to plant appropriate ground covers, which is for another talk because there's a lot of different ground covers. I did show you some of the natives before but we'll make sure that we post something on our website for you to uh, take a look at in detail with some pictures. Um, we wanna make sure that we have uh, well-drained soils, any place where we have water accumulating, we can have pithy and other diseases come in to attack that turf grass, and that can spread throughout our areas. We wanna maintain the pH of that turf grass between six and 6.5, and then we wanna reduce compaction in those areas by doing coloration in the fall. And we're gonna talk about coloration uh, towards the end. Next slide. Okay, so seeding is best done late summer, uh, early fall. So typically we go in late August or September is the, probably the best time for most of New Jersey. And then spring is the second best time. And the reason it's the second best time is we literally have tens of thousands of weeds germinating in the springtime. So if we seed in the late summer, early fall, we're coming into a cooler part of the season we have less annual weeds germinating simultaneously, um, so we usually have better success by seeding in the fall. However, some people are out there reseeding their lawns or overseeding right now. And what you see in the top slide there is a picture of an overseeder, which you can rent, um, and it actually has settings on it for the different types of grasses. And that will actually um, create a little bit of a trench, so it, it actually has these little tines, almost like a dethatching machine which what you would do before you overseed is you basically mow the lawn a little bit lower to about an inch and a half. Uh, then you could go into this overseeder and down the type of seed that is recommended for your area, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. And you would go in two different directions with that and then keep that watered until it germinates properly. And you wanna select the highest quality seeds for your site. We're gonna tell you how to do that in a minute. Next slide. So, uh, hopefully many of you have a, uh, when you're getting ready to seed, it looks just like this. But if it, um, the idea here is to have the seed so that it's in direct contact with the soil. Uh, and that's very important because if the seed contacts the soil, then you're going to have adequate germination. But right after we seed, we need to rake over that area. Otherwise, the birds will come in. We just like the Alfred Hitchcock movie with the birds where the birds will eat every last seed that we put out there unless we cover that seed over uh, very lightly. And you can just drag a rake over the top of that or um, uh, drag uh, any object over the surface just to cover the seed, or you could put some mulch over top of there, just a very thin layer of compost or mulch or other materials, uh, and that would help that seed to germinate. You would want to use organic compost or peat moss uh, over that if you didn't have, uh, you know, if you wanted to add organic matter at the same time. But normally, I recommend if you're starting over from scratch, you probably want to incorporate that organic matter right into the soil. Um, you can increase your organic matter within the soil um, in the top six to eight inches. Next slide. Okay, so when you seed, really, uh, as you see here on the left, you want this type of concentration of seed. You know, if it's uh, bluegrass or fine fescues, it's 
seed it and then you've covered that seed over so the birds don't get to it. Usually about seven to 10 days, you're gonna to start to see uh, perennial ryegrasses coming up. And then 14 to 18 days, you're gonna to start to see bluegrasses and fine fescues come up if you have a spine shape mix. Um, the perennial ryegrass actually comes in first in some of the sudden shade mixes because it's the largest seed size, most aggressive, so it comes in first. Next slide. And then you want to cover that area. It's not a good idea to use the kind of covers you see on the left here. It's better to use, uh, to just really cover it over by raking it or use a little bit of straw, but not too much straw. Um, if you want to keep birds out of those areas and you just want to protect that. Uh, area so that birds are not feeding and other animals are not feeding on the seed that you just put down. Next slide. Okay, so these are the primary types of grasses that we grow um, in the Northeast. And these are the best grasses really for our area. Um, Kentucky bluegrasses and literally hundreds if not thousands of varieties of Kentucky bluegrasses. And the group of five Fescues, which, in, which includes subgroups of hard fescues, creeping red, chewing fescue, and then the turf type uh, tall fescues and perennial ryegrass. We're going to focus on two of these grasses for low maintenance, environmentally friendly areas, which are the turf type tall fescues and the fine fescues. And the reason for that is the turf type tall fescues and fine fescues have much deeper root systems, so they can survive under droughtier conditions. They'll be able to harvest nutrients from much deeper in the soil. They require less water, less fertilizer. So they're really an earth-friendly grass. So those are the grasses that we really want to plant. Perennial ryegrass, on the other hand, will require more mowing, uh, requires more fertilizer, and it also has a disease that can attack it in our area called red thread disease, which could be problematic in many parts of the state. I will show you a few Kentucky bluegrasses um, like midnight that can grow in partly shady areas and is a little bit better adapted to, to low maintenance conditions. But for the most part, let's focus on fine fescues and turf type tall fescues when you go out to buy your seed. Next slide. Any questions on that, Michelle? Um, there's, there are questions related to, and I'm sure you're gonna talk about this. Yes, yeah, so it's good that you're getting to the low maintenance turf grass varieties. And then folks are asking questions about, about weeds in, in the lawn, in dandelions. Um, some people okay. are, are having issues with wanting the dandelions because of the pollinators, but then also not wanting the dandelions to take over. Okay. So we'll get to that in a little bit. The, the idea of having um, uh, the right type of grasses for your, your location and also breaking up compaction is that you're going to encourage the grasses that we have there to flourish. And you're providing that underlying soil environment to really enhance the growth of those plants. So for lower maintenance conditions, which I hope all of us um, are trying to, and when I say low maintenance, I mean less fertilizers, less water, less mowing, um, and I think most of us want that. So we're going to choose the fine fescues. Um, there are different subgroups of the fine fescues, the hard, chewing, strong, creeping red, uh, turf-type tall fescues, and then select Kentucky bluegrass. But we're going to avoid perennial ryegrasses uh, for low-maintenance lawns. Next slide. We're going to talk about some of those weeds in a minute. One important relationship for you to understand is a symbiotic relationship with endophytes. Endophytes are actually a beneficial fungus that actually lives within the seed of grass, and it grows up in through the sheath tissue of the grass. And it's naturally in many of our fine fescues and tall fescue varieties, and in also in perennial ryegrass varieties, select varieties, but it's currently not in most of the Kentucky bluegrasses that we have out there. And here you see a picture of it in the slide on top where the endophyte, the fungal thread, or the mycelium is actually growing through that grass blade and it's stained here with a blue stain. Um, and then at the bottom slide, you can also see where the endophyte is existing within the seed itself. So when you buy seed that contains endophytes, the endophyte actually exists within that plant, grows in the sheath tissue, but this endophyte actually protects turf grass from many of our surface feeding insects, and as you'll see in a minute, also protects them from diseases. So it's a good idea to buy turf grass that contains endophytes. 
and it'll either say contain endophytes on the package or it will say myco advantage myco and if you look a little bit closer the myco advantage is the fact that it contains this beneficial fungus next slide so the benefits of this uh, endophyte within your grass seed and you want to use that seed the same year that you buy it um, is it produces these alkaloids which can deter uh, chinch bugs and sod webworm and many of the insects that attack our plants. So it actually gives us built-in resistance to many of these problems. So we can actually cut out most, if not all, of our insecticides uh, if we have endophytes within that system. And recently, researchers at Rutgers have also found that uh, with certain fine fescue varieties, that if endophytes are there, they can protect us against diseases like dollar spot, red thread, and summer patch. So it has a dual effect on specific types of grass varieties. It can protect us against certain insect invaders and also protect us against uh, certain types of fungal invaders that can cause disease problems. Next slide. Any questions on that so far? Yeah, um, well, there was one question on uh, if they have an established lawn, is it, is it um, still possible to to encourage endophytes in the, in the lawn? Great, that's a great question. And um, so yes, you can, what you would do is when I overseed, and, and overseeding is a great thing to do. If you have marginal lawns that you're having problems with, you would, uh, the next time you seed, say in the fall, or if you're putting some seed down right now even, go ahead and buy some endophytic grasses and incorporate those into your lawn by using an overseeder. And by doing that, uh, even if you have as little as 30% endophytic grass within your lawn, it's going to start to give you adequate control of many of those surface invaders. So you can do it at any time, and then over the years, just keep incorporating endophytic grasses into your established lawn. And I'm going to tell you a little bit later. I'll tell you the story of what I did, because I totally redid my lawn uh, last year to get some new varieties in there, and it's really looking good, so I'll tell you exactly the procedure I walked through. Um, here you see where we've got endophytes. This is actually the same exact variety on the right that's on the left. Where we had endophytes in there, you can see that it protected the grass completely. But where we didn't have the endophytes, endophyte minus, same exact variety, but it was totally attacked by the chinch bugs. So that's a good clear sign of the endophyte doing its job when we need it. Next slide. Uh, what was well on and endophytes um, before we leave? Um, there's a question, are the endophytes only present in the seed or is it also present in the established lawn? So the endophyte um, comes with the seed when you buy it and you want to buy seed that's relatively um, new and you keep it in a cool dry place. You want to use all that seed that year because the problem with endoph endophytic seed is that if you store it for too long, the endophytes start to dissipate or, or disappear. Um, if you store them for a year or two and it's not kept in a cool, dry place, if it's too hot or too moist, uh, the endophyte can dry out within the seed. Next slide. So, to, yeah, to get back to that question, so it is in the seed. Um, it's in the top parts of the sheath, but it's also going to be transferred into, it's going to stay with that grass the whole time that grass is growing. So this is just a list of some of the hard fescues that will do extremely well in your lawn. And I'm going to show you some websites that you can go to as well. But these are great varieties to use within your lawn. These are ones that were tested by Rutgers and other universities with an experiment station um, doing adequate, you know, um, regular research every year with field trials. And so there's many, many good varieties out there. And I'm going to send you to a website that has literally hundreds of varieties that we've tested that do extremely well. So if you see any of these varieties on the seed packets that you're looking on, um, you know you're getting a good variety. Just one of them is in the mix. Um, so Oxford, some of the ones I've tested myself, Oxford, Reliant, we've had in their trials out at the Earth Center, um, Blu-ray, Viking, all great varieties. Next slide. So here's one of the trials out in the field where it's between some other trials that we're doing with tree species. And we're just looking at how each one of those hard fescues do uh, in those trials under different levels of shade. Um, and you can see that the, the fine fescues do extremely well under partial shade conditions. So variety selection is really important. If you select the varieties that we recommend at Rutgers and Cornell and Penn State for our area, that you're going to have varieties that are going to hold up under the conditions that you have within your environment. But you do have to provide 
um, organic matter to those soils, you have to adjust the pH, and you have to uh, decompact the soils of chlorination periodically. Next slide. And here's a whole grouping of, of turf type tall fescues. The one great thing about turf type tall fescues is they have a very deep root system. So their roots go down two, three, sometimes four times the depth of uh, beyond uh, bluegrasses and, and beyond uh, different types of uh, ryegrass. So most of the ones you see here are, are going to do much better under low maintenance conditions. And if you're trying to, if you're going out there and you want to reestablish a lawn, I would recommend going with the new turf type tall fescues. Um, all these varieties here do extremely well in New Jersey. So, um, and we'll have this list available for you on the website, as well as I believe most of these slides will be posted on the website. Um, some of the ones that I've worked with, the Rebel Series, the Rembrandt, um, you'll see Rebel Series, I think, in most of your garden stores right now. Um, you'll also see Titanium, many of these other varieties that are pretty common. Um, Van Gogh, Mustang Series is, is uh, available out there in most of the lawn and garden stores, the Falcon varieties. So these are just all great examples of different grasses that you can select uh, that are really going to outperform other grasses because they have the genetics. It's like it's like buying a racehorse. You know, these are good racehorses. They're going to survive under our conditions and do well with our fluctuating crazy weather that we have in New Jersey. Next slide. Um, there's a few bluegrass varieties. If you're stuck on bluegrass, even though it requires um, a little bit more in terms of fertilizer and uh, water inputs and moisture, um, some that will do fairly well under low maintenance, like Cabernet, Aura, Zinfandel, Midnight, Bewitched, Rhapsody, Bedazzled. Some of those will actually do okay under lower input conditions. So that's less fertilizer, um, uh, less inputs of water. But remember, the Kentucky bluegrasses in general are going to be more shallow roots, so they're going to be a little bit more challenging in areas where we're not, um, you know, regularly dethatching them because bluegrasses tend to get more thatch. So if you're looking for uh, lower maintenance grasses, uh, I probably would not go with the bluegrasses in general. I would stay with the fine fescues and the turf type tall fescues. Next slide. Any questions on that? Do you see Michelle or anyone? Yeah, yeah. Um there's some questions about, um, I, uh, from, from folks in, from other states, um, someone from, from Virginia asking if these varieties would work well in, in other areas. Okay, when you get down to Virginia, it depends on where you're at because you're um, a little bit south. You know, some of the southern grasses will do quite well down there. Um, so they really need to look at their local cooperative extension uh, list of varieties that were tested. Um, at Virginia Polytech, because I know Virginia Polytech does a, quite a bit of testing down in that area. So if you're from another state, I would look specifically at the varieties they've tested at their experiment station, uh, and they can give you the best clue in terms of what's going to work. Um, you know, even zoysia grass, not everybody likes it in our area, but zoysia grass is a southern grass that some people love, and some people grow it in our neighborhood, but then others want to keep it out of their yard because it looks brown a good portion of the year. Um, but if you if you know how to grow zoysia grass, it can be quite a, a good grass in terms of its density. It can actually crowd out most weeds that are coming in. So for some people in our neck of the woods, they really love zoysia grass. But the grasses that are really adapted to our area and will tolerate colder winters are going to be the cool season grasses. Next slide. Uh, before we move on, there was a question just uh, about the, these, you know, they're all uh, Kentucky bluegrasses. There was a question was, what is the difference between these different, these different uh, grass types here? So these are like genetic cat categorizations of grasses that just um, come from a different set of, you know, it's almost like uh, different genotypes that within that system. And these grasses, what we typically will do, some can combine with others. It gets kind of complicated when we're talking about the, the mid-Atlantic types versus the compact type. But overall, what you would want to do, um, you would want to grow grasses within that range of the, of the different types. Like, for instance, grow Cabernet with Aura, with Zinfandel. And I always recommend that you mix at least three to five species of those in the same or similar category. 
Um, and then with the other grasses too, you wanna to mix more than one variety so that you have genetic variability. So by having more than one grass type in there, we, if one disease or one insect invades it, you can actually have uh, longer term resistance. But they're just an overall different categories of, you know, the compact types are just going to stay a little bit more compact, not as much in terms of spreading. Uh, the midnight types were developed originally from Rutgers, uh, from Dr. Uh, Funk, Reed Funk back many years ago. Uh, those varieties were looked at specifically for their, some of their adaptation to shade conditions. The mid-Atlantic types were a general uh, category of varieties that would do well throughout the entire Northeast. Um, so yeah, they're just um, different categories that we use as geneticists to separate out the, the different types of Kentucky bluegrass. Next slide. Okay. There was a question on any, any recommendations uh, for, for issues with crabgrass. Yeah, we're gonna talk about crabgrass in a minute. The best way to keep crabgrass out, I'll tell you real quick, is to increase your mowing height, decrease compaction. Um, your crabgrass will disappear over a matter of a year or two just by increasing your mowing height, uh, reducing any compaction issues, and also seeding some of these varieties I recommend. Um, there's also a great place that no matter where you are, if you're at the store, you can put this on your cell phones, you can look it up, but it's National Turfgrass Evaluation Program or NTEP.org. Um, on this, you can select a New Jersey site. It'll give you the information that we have on where you can get, you know, the different varieties that perform best in our area, all the different cool season varieties. It'll give you the data that we've uh, accumulated over the years. What are the best varieties that have good green color, that have excellent density in the beginning or mid portions of the year? And then the green up just gives us an idea whether or not that grass greens up earlier in the season. Uh, than other grasses. And then there's also a pest resistant rating that tells us whether or not specific uh, varieties of turf grass have resistance to many of these insect feeders. So you can find all that on this one convenient website. So you can go there and, and find varieties. And if you're out at a Lowe's or Home Depot or Ace Hardware, wherever you go, you can actually look at your the grass that you have on there, look it up and see on the list whether or not it matches up some of these better varieties that we recommend in New Jersey. And no matter what state you're from, you can look this up. So you just click on your state. If you're from Virginia, just go ahead and click on Virginia and it's gonna give you the varieties uh, that do best in Virginia that was uh, tested by the Virginia Experiment Station. Next slide. Uh, watering is very important too uh, for lawns because if we don't provide adequate water, uh, lawns will go into dormancy. Um, and I always say if we're having a drought, um, it's best to irrigate your trees and shrubs and let your lawn go into dormancy uh, because you want to protect those trees and shrubs that have taken you 10 or 15 or 20 or 50 years to grow. So those are my primary targets for saving because it's relatively easy to reestablish a lawn. So I, I, I typically don't use a lot of irrigation on my lawns. What I will do is I will select grasses like the tall fescues and the fine fescues that have deeper root systems. So once they're established, I really don't need to irrigate those lawns. And I would really recommend that you don't irrigate lawns once they're established, that if you have to periodically give them a little bit of irrigation, it's fine. But if there's a shortage of water in the area, uh, then definitely just keep your trees and shrubs that would be where I'd focus the irrigation. Um, when you do irrigate, you want to irrigate early in the morning because it conserves moisture and it reduces disease problems on turf grass as well as many of our other plants in the landscape uh, and our vegetable plants as well. Next slide. Many different types of mowers out there from the real mowers you see up on the left to uh, standard rotary mowers to new electric motors, uh, mowers and mowers that can actually be charged by solar. Uh, the one in the bottom corner is actually one that comes with a little solar panel that you can hang outside of your building you can run the cord in or you can just leave the mower in the backyard if you don't have neighbors that are going to steal your mower. And you can go ahead and charge that mower up um, so that it's ready to go. Uh, with the electric mowers, there's a lot of varieties out there now, just as with all the electric technology. Um, there are varieties, uh, different types of mowers that come with extended battery packs. So that even if you have a larger lawn now, you can get uh, additional battery packs. Um, so there's a, there are different ways to go. The real mowers, uh, like the one on the, the, the top there in the top left, 
um, will give you a lot of exercise. So you won't have to go to the gym if you use that mower. Um, and then the standard mowers, we want to keep those serviced too, so that they don't produce a lot of uh, harmful carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide into the atmosphere. So you want to keep the air cleaners clean on those mowers too, so we use less gas, um, re reduce the amount of pollutants that they give off. Next slide. Um, so adjusting the mowing height is very important. We want to make sure that the grass is mowed at three to three and a half inches high. We do not want to go lower. The only time that we mow the lawn closer than three inches is when we're overseeding or we're doing renovation work in September. And keeping the lawn mowed at a higher height, we can see on the diagram here that the root systems themselves will develop much deeper into the soil and we'll actually have much healthier turf grass. And the intercalary meristem, which provides the growth point of the grass, will actually be healthier when it's shaded. So higher turf grass, three to three and a half inches, you're gonna have a healthier uh, meristem on that. You're gonna have healthier roots. And overall, you're gonna shade out weeds because now those weed seeds can't get to the soil. So you have a situation where you're actually improving the health of the grass. You're preventing weed seeds from germinating. So we can really cut back on the amount of herbicides that we need to use. And it's going to cut back on those weeds like crabgrass. Um, many studies have indicated that if you continue to mow at three to three and a half inches over a period, longer period of time, mo many of those annual weeds are just going to disappear from your lawn as long as you're doing everything else we're talking about today correctly and you're periodically overseeding in September. And so you want to make sure that that mower blade that you see there on that bottom of that slide, that mower blade where it's actually the cutting part of that blade is, is right at the three to three and a half inches. Okay, next slide. Any questions on that, on cutting height? Um, no, no. Okay, so one very important thing that's easy to do um, and can reduce disease problems and stress problems on your lawn is just keep the mower blades very sharp. And here you see a mulching blade and a regular blade. It doesn't matter whether you use a standard uh, blade or a mulching blade, as long as you keep those blades razor sharp, um, and it's easy enough to do that with a file, then you're going to have that grass recover much faster. You're gonna have less foliar disease problems because within a day, the grass is gonna be able to bounce back. But if you see, if you look at the edge of the grass blade and you see that it's tearing the grass uh, and it's not a clean cut, then that's when you know you need to um, sharpen up those mower blades. And here it's just showing on the right how you can just take a ratchet, um, make sure that you pull the spark plug out before you do this, roll it up on the right side so that your carburetor's on top, um, and then go ahead and take the old blade off and sharpen it up on a grinding stone and then put it back on, make sure you tighten, make sure it's going in the same direction that it needs to be going in so that uh, you're not beating the grass to death, you're actually mowing the grass and you'll be all set. Um, just that simple thing of keeping grass blades sharp, uh, the, the mower blades sharp, it's going to make sure that the turf grass will recover and you'll have less problems. I usually have a, several extra blades that I keep sharp and then I just pop them on as I need them through the year. It's also a good way where you can recycle the blades. You don't get rid of the old blades, you just keep um, sharpening them. The only time you get rid of them is the blade on the right there that's got some big chips in it. Well, that thing's probably ready for recycling at that point because it's got some huge chips cut out of it. So you may want to get a new blade if you have damage to the blade. Okay, next slide. Any questions on that? Um, there's a question about um, some people want to know about getting rid of certain species like annual bluegrass or zoysia grass. Okay. Annual bluegrass is a bugger because uh, most of the materials that we have, um, the majority of materials that we have don't just control uh, annual bluegrass without doing damage. So what people will do is they'll use a non-selective herbicide um, such as Roundup on areas where they have it, but they've got to just spray the area where they have that grass to kill it because anything you spray with a non-selective such as Roundup is going to kill all that. Another alternative, if you want to go organic, there are some materials like Avenger and materials that are basically acid uh, mixed in with different salt products um, that you can use in those areas and it'll actually kill back the surface. Um, and then you can reseed those areas where you have those weed problems um, 
uh, with some other types of quality cool season grasses. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. So recycling grass clippings is great because it can provide between, and when I say recycle grass clippings, it means we're putting them right back onto the lawn. It can provide between 30 and 50 percent of the nitrogen needs. And especially with fine fescue, it's actually giving us 50 percent or more of our nitrogen needs. So if we had, if we were growing fine fescue in an area, um, once it's established, and we had clover growing in with a fine fescue, and then we're recycling grass clippings, we don't need to add any additional fertilizer. We could simply just recycle the clippings, and then periodically, if we can add some compost over those areas, um, we would give it all the nutrients that it needs basically for that site. So grass clippings are a great slow-release source of nitrogen. All of our research indicates, Joe Heckman did some great research at Rutgers University, and he uh, was showing over a five-year period that no matter what the regime, no matter how much fertilizer we added, when we recycle grass back onto the lawn, we have much healthier turf grass, and we had less problems. Uh, the, the grass would actually green up earlier in the spring, and would stay green longer uh, later in the fall, even when we use different levels of nitrogen uh, fertilizers. Next slide. Tell me if we're going a little long or something here. Um, so apply fertilizers in line based on soil test. Um, and we wanna make sure that we get a soil test so that we know exactly how, if we need lime and how much lime to use. The soil test that comes back from the Rutgers lab or from the whatever private lab you send your soil test to is gonna also tell you that it's gonna tell you the pH, it's gonna tell you some of the macronutrients like phosphorus and potassium and uh, calcium and magnesium levels. Uh, and it'll tell you what you need to add and a certain type of formulation of fertilizer that you need to add. So when you get those tests back from Stephanie Murphy's lab over at Rutgers, it's gonna tell you exactly what you'll need for your particular landscape. Um, as a master gardener and as an environmental steward, we, we recommend to all of our students that they don't use combination fertilizers and pesticides um, and blanket the entire area. We typically want people to spot treat a problem where they see it but not put a, uh, a, a pesticide on an entire area unless you specifically know what the problem is. It doesn't make sense to be adding product unless we determine the exact disease or insect problem because most of the problems that you're seeing here, if you do what I'm talking about today, you can actually prevent or completely avoid many of the problems. So you, you can actually cut out most of your pesticide use just by proper mowing, proper fertilization, uh, and the use of proper varieties. And when we do fertilize, we never want to fertilize lawns during hot weather. Um, when lawns are in the dormancy, uh, we can make one spring application and then possibly another application in mid to late September. Next slide. There's a lot of um, natural materials for people that uh, want to go organic. You know, one of the best is just use grass clippings, recycle them back onto the lawn. You can also use backyard compost and composted manures that have completely broken down, kelp meal, blood meal, alfalfa pellets. There's many different products out there. Also products like Earthrite that are recycled uh, uh, biosolids products. You just want to be careful with Earthrite and Malorganite uh, with those materials um, if you're going to start a vegetable garden uh, in the future where you put down those materials. Next slide. So we want to make sure that we um, keep fertilizer on the lawn. So if we spill fertilizer on walkways or other areas, we want to clear, clean that fertilizer up, put it back onto lawn areas or put it back in the bag, depending on how much we've put down. Apply the fertilizer based on the recommendations on the bag. So it will say right on the fertilizer bag um, how much to apply and what settings to use for different types of spreaders. And whenever we can use a drop spreader, the drop spreader is usually more accurate than something like this rotary spreader. Um, some rotary spreaders now come with a guard on the side so that you can prevent that excess fertilizer from going into areas where you don't want it to go. Uh, next, but you cannot, you, you could use that uh, spreader in areas where you want to put down compost too. I actually have dried the compost, put it through a rotary spreader, uh, and it makes a nice addition. You, you just never want to put compost more than an eighth or a quarter of an inch down at a time. Here's, the, here's describing the facts. So here we're going to describe exactly what we're trying to get rid of in the fall. If we have more than a half inch of thatch, and thatch, if we fall the grass blade down to where it turns from green to whitish to get to the crown tissue, and then right below that is a, a layer of thatch on many of our 
uh, grasses that form rhizomes um, such as bluegrass. And what it is, it's, it's an area of living and mostly dead rhizomes, roots, and crown tissue. Um, up, and it's almost like putting a sheet of plastic in between the crowns and the roots of the plant. Uh, it, it can be good when it's less than a half inch in thickness because it protects the roots. But when it's more than half inch in thickness, um, and we can simply determine that by digging down a little bit, or if you're walking on the grass and it's um, really spongy um, when you walk on the grass, then you need to get out there with a little trowel or screwdriver and see how thick the thatch is. So when it becomes a half inch or more in thickness, then we dethatch in September. So we rent a dethatching machine. Uh, we set the dethatching blades to just go right below that thatch layer that you see there and kick up just a little bit of soil. And we'll go in two different directions. And what that will do is that will actually um, remove excess thatch. It'll bring a little bit of soil in to break up the rest of the thatch um, and, and also help to reduce disease and insect problems. Next slide. So here's a dethatching machine, and after we dethatch, we do want to rake that thatch off and put it in our compost pile. Uh, never put thatch or grass clippings out on the curb. Always make sure you're recycling those materials either back onto the lawn, or in the case of thatch, we want to put that in the compost pile to break it down because it has a very high lignin content, so it's going to take a while for that to break down. So we re uh, dethatch in two different directions in September. is the best time to do it. Before we dethatch, we always bring the mowing height down. We want the lawn, uh, the soil in that area to be just a little bit on the moist side, not too dry or not too wet, um, because either extreme will have problems with tearing out too much grass, or if it's too dry, it'll tear up the uh, dethatching machine. So then we rake off the thatch, and then we fertilize the areas where we dethatch with about a half a pound of nitrogen per thousand square foot. And in about three to four weeks, that turf grass area is going to recover, and it's going to look great. And if we have to core air rate, we could do that right after that. Any questions on dethatching? Um, not questions on, on dethatching. Since you bring up uh, fertilizing, there was a question about what type of fertilizer is recommended. Okay, so there's many different fertilizers out there. Some of the ones I listed on that slide are organic-based fertilizers. So if you want to go organic, you would look for something with an OMRI label, on it, Organic Materials Research Institute. Uh, if you're not going with organics and you just want to buy a conventional fertilizer, whether it be a 10 10 10 or, uh, uh, you know, um, encapsulated types of urea materials, um, then you could simply get the cheapest fertilizer that you can find out there. Um, I like the slow release uh, fertilizers on lawns because I, I just think they stick around longer whether you put them down in the spring or in the fall. Um, so the slow release fertilizers are really the best way to go. And you'll see, you, you want to buy a fertilizer that doesn't have weed killer in it because you just want to put fertilizers down um, when you're fertilizing. And if you have weed problems, you can spot treat those weed problems. Uh, but there's many, many different types of lawn fertilizers out there, and it'll say slow release. Uh, uh, usually sulfur-coated ureas are one option that's out there that work very well. Uh, I just use some of that in one area of my lawn, the sulfur-coated urea, to, to just bring the lawn back to life because I had done some seeding last year. Um, but just buy the cheapest one that's available um, that's, that's uh, slow-release material. Next slide. Okay, so here you can see where they removed the thatch uh, from the areas. And here they didn't have a regular dethatching machine, but they had a mantis type uh, tiller, but with slow moving tines. And they dethatched in two different directions and they simply pulled that off the lawn. And then the lawn started to recover after that. It would put some nitrogen down in those areas. Um, next slide. And core aerator um, is basically, this machine is used uh, in the fall, typically in September. And what it does is it cores down and removes plugs of soil on many of our compacted soils that we have in the Northeast. And this is a great idea to use this periodically if you have moderate or heavy soils, if you have clay-based soils or you've had compaction problems. If you have mostly weeds in your lawn, it's a, probably a good indicator that you've got compaction problems or pH problems. So I'd highly recommend that you do coration primarily in the fall, 
But if you needed to do it now, you could. You'd still have time if you got out there right away. But the, really the best time to do it uh, is in the fall, usually in September in our area. Um, and after you core aerate, after you remove those plugs and they come to the surface, uh, then you, if you had your soil test back, you could also adjust the pH if you needed to add lime or if you needed to add sulfur to bring the pH down, depends on your soil test. So you would adjust the pH. You could put some organic materials down. If you didn't have compost, you could put, add a little peat moss down, maybe a you know, half inch of peat moss, spread that over the area. Um, and that would help the um, oxygen levels to get down into root systems. It would help to decompact those areas, stimulate beneficial microbes, um, and really uh, what goes a long way if you uh, do core aeration, especially if you've had a, a compaction uh, issue for many years, uh, you'd want to core, uh, core aerate in the uh, fall. Uh, so this is the best kind of core aerator. The new ones that come out, I actually used one last year on my own lawn. It actually has a roller that's right on the back that you fill with just a little bit of water so that it will just crush those plugs as you go. Um, and then you can go ahead and spread your uh, compost or other organic material right over the surface. Um, as with any type of renovation, uh, before you do core aeration or before you do dethatching in September, you'd want to make sure that um, you mow the lawn a little bit lower, like an inch, inch and a half, um, so that you have less damage to the existing lawn that's there. And then what I would recommend is after you do all these renovation techniques, you come in and you overseed with some of these quality grasses that we recommended by using a grass overseeder, um, and then just keep it watered. And you'll have a new lawn coming in and you'll uh, solve some of your compaction problems. Next slide. Any questions on? Can, um, yeah. Um, can aeration be done now? And uh, where, if, if someone did want to do it now, could they rent the, the um, aerator? I believe that I believe the stores are are renting equipment right now. So um, it, I guess it depends on where you live as to whether the stores are actively renting, but. You could do it now, but really the best time to do it is in the fall. Um, I always do my aeration, and, and we used to work a lot in, in, in turf research. We do the aeration in September, uh, which is really the best for all of New Jersey, um, because then you're coming into a cooler part of the season. You have less weed competition in the fall, so you'll have less weed invasion at that time. But, yes, you can do it right now. I wouldn't wait any longer if you're going to do it. I would do it very soon and then overseed right on top of it after you've done it. Next slide. As far as the um, frequency of, of aeration, would, is it something that was done every year or? Uh, okay, good question. Uh, frequency of aeration really depends on how compact your soil is and how much traffic you have. If you have a lot of traffic due to kids or pets or animals or whatever, um, or heavier equipment uh, going over an area like heavy mowers or whatever, you may need to aerate every couple of years. Um, I typically will aerate every third year on my lawn just to keep the soil uh, loose because we have a little bit heavier soils, textured soils where I'm at, so we have a little bit more clay and silt in those soils. So aerating every second or third year really kind of uh, prevents compaction from becoming a real serious problem because once you have compaction in an area, you're going to see weeds come in. That's why I say you really can get away from a lot of herbicides and a lot of different pesticides just by doing the right thing, by overseeding with good quality grasses and by uh, aerating and doing detaching. It goes a long way to improving the underlying quality so that these turf grasses can remain healthy within that environment. Next slide. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it does. And then uh, which, which would you recommend first, the thatching or the aerating? Well, I've done both, and that's a good question. Uh, what I'd probably recommend is that you do the dethatching first, and the reason for that is you need to remove that thatch from the area and put that in your compost pile, whereas is if you uh, then you core aerate afterwards and you have one of those core aerators that has a roll over in the back, that's going to be cleaner when you go to remove uh, the thatch as the first step. You can rake it off and then come in with a core aerator, and then you have the roller in the back and then you apply your organic materials at that time. Um, let's talk a little bit about pest and disease control because these pest and disease problems will start to be less of a problem if you focus on proper varieties, proper mowing, proper fertilization. 
But in integrated pest management or IPM, we recommend that everyone use an IPM system, whether it be in your vegetable garden or your lawn care, no matter what you're doing. So what that means is we properly identify the problem at hand. Here we see, what do we see here? Does anyone want to comment here? Any Anybody getting back to me on what they're seeing? What are these little tiny uh, creatures? Yeah, so folks are coming in, lots of people saying grubs. Grubs, are the grubs, grubs. right. <laughs> so it's a white grub. The white grub complex, which can be caused by many different adult beetles laying their eggs in the lawn. And when we have more than 12 or 15 of these grubs per square foot, we sometimes need to take action and use some of the grub controls. But what we found in the research, um, uh, some of our entomologists at Rutgers have found that even under higher densities of grubs, if we select the right varieties, if we have the right density, we've done uh, correlation. Um, the lawn will actually outgrow even the highest density of grubs. So in many cases, we don't even need to use insecticides when we're selecting the right variety and doing all the right things we talked about today. So in an IPM system, first we identify the problem. We determine the severity of the problem. If the problem reaches a certain threshold level, like it does between 10 and 15 grubs per square foot or whatever, then we know that we can take action uh, and we can use biological controls. Uh, we determine if control is needed. In many cases, it's not. We can go ahead and just um, adjust the situation with good cultural management. And then if we're going to control a problem in any landscape or any setting, we want to base the control on the life cycle of the pest. Next slide. Okay, so, uh, we, you know, we saw the grubs earlier, and here's another shot of the grubs and some of the adult beetles, like Japanese beetles and June beetles, uh, oriental beetles that can cause they're the adults, they lay their eggs on the grass, and then in turn the white grub complex can exist within the turf grass. And those little grubs actually feed on the roots of the turf grass. Um, and actually you can see up on the far left there, does any, anybody want to respond to what they think that problem is? You see any responses? Go ahead and type in your response. On the upper left, correct, Bill? Upper left, yeah. What, what's, what's happening up there if you can see it? <laughs> digging through the lawn. It's not your neighbor either. So we've got lots of different answers coming in. Somebody says jellyfish. Another one says moles, skunks, worms, groundhogs, voles, okay. squirrels. <laughs> okay, so moles like to come in. That's moles. And moles like to come in and feed on the grubs. So if you have a mole problem out there, the, the mole problem is due to the fact that you've got grubs that they're feeding on and other insects. So uh, we may need to control those grubs if we're going to actually control the voles because there's not a lot of really great controls out there for the voles because they're just going to feed on these little guys. Um, and you see on the Japanese beetle there, Papilia japonica, on the bottom left corner there, there's a little white dot on there. Well, actually, that's actually a beneficial uh, tachno wasp that's laid its egg on there, um, and that's going to actually kill some of the adults. Next slide. So we're just going to go over some quick things you can do, and then we're going to open it up for questions after we get through our slides. So some of the biopesticides or alternatives that we can use for grubs include milky disease spore, um, which targets Japanese beetles. So we have to know what kind of beetles we have. So if you want to learn more about the different beetle species, um, you can contact us on the web. Um, milky disease spore will take several years for it to control, whereas parasitic nematodes can also provide adequate control for many of the white grub complex species that we see. Uh, parasitic nematodes are applied in the beginning to mid-August um, where we've had grub problems. Um, and you, you actually get those parasitic nematodes, you order them online, you keep them refrigerated until you're ready to use them. They come in a little sponge, you put them in a spray-on device, and then right before it gets dark, you go ahead and spray the area uh, that you want these nematodes to, and they will actually go down into the soil uh, with the water that you provide in irrigation. And they will swim down and swim into the grubs and actually deliver a bacteria which will um, expand and explode the grub. So it's pretty cool and it works really well. Uh, so the parasitic, parasitic nematodes can give you control in as little as 72 hours, whereas milky disease spore, uh, it, it may take a year to several years for it to give you adequate control. Uh, it's not 100, none of these uh, systems are 100% and they're not designed to be because in an IPM system, we're just trying to bring down the population so that it's at a reasonable level. Uh, we're not trying to annihilate everything within the soil. 
Next slide. Uh, folks, I'm going to, Bill's going to be uh, finishing up in, in, in the next few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and open up the poll, and you can get started on that when, when you get a, a chance. Um, just make sure when you are answering the poll questions, when you're done, that you hit submit on the bottom. So I'm going to open up that poll now. Okay. Okay. Next. Okay, so here's some really easy cultural strategies to control most of our insect problems. One is to maintain adequate soil moisture. So that means we're getting an inch to an inch and a half of water um, on the turf grass areas per week or areas where we have trees and shrubs. Uh, another great thing is to avoid thatch buildup. If the thatch in the soil or in the uh, lawn areas builds up to more than a half inch, it can harbor a lot of insect and disease problems. So we want to make sure that we're periodically dethatching our lawn uh, to reduce the amount of insect problems. Also, uh, we want to use endophyte enhanced varieties. So take a look at the turf type tall fescues and the fine fescues that I recommended and look for ones that contain endophytes. It should say it right on the package. Um, and you can look the variety up online to see whether or not that variety contains endophytes. Next slide. Okay, uh, a real uh, accurate way to, just to reduce the amount of diseases that we have on turf is to use good sound cultural practices. So that means we can target um, uh, re reducing stress on turf. So that means proper mowing of turf, having sharp mower blades so that the, the turf recovers very rapidly. We wanna irrigate early in the morning so that the sun will come out eventually and burn any excess moisture off. The moisture is not sitting all night long. We tend to have less foliar diseases on the turf. Uh, controlling thatch will actually reduce areas where the disease spores can hide out. So it's, it's a good idea to control that thatch uh, so that it's less than a half inch in thickness. By reducing compaction, we actually increase the health of the turf grass so that the turf grass is under less stress. And then we'll see a much greener, healthier turf grass that doesn't have many of these foliar diseases. And then last but not least, a very important thing is to select those resistant varieties uh, of grasses so that they will come in with natural resistance to many of the diseases that we face. And when you look at the, when you go on to the ND, uh, National Turf Grass Evaluation Program, you'll see many varieties listed that have resistance to a lot of our foliar diseases that we have in the Northeast. Next slide. Here's some of the common weeds that we face. Um, anybody know what number one is? Any responses there? Um, and we need some Jeopardy music or something. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, people are seeing uh, plantain. Right, great. Plantain is number one. Plantain. Great. And number two is what? Anybody have an idea what number two is? Uh, mint, watercress, clove, chickweed. Weed. Somebody says chickweed. Yep, so it's chickweed. Um, and then number three is purslane. That usually comes in in more open areas. Um, I just had a good shot of that the other day, so I threw it in. Number four is clover, white clover. And we were saying that clover for many people is not a weed and actually is a good thing to have in many situations because the clover will fix nitrogen and it will actually help turf grass in many areas. Now, some people don't want all clover, and I understand that. So in those areas where you see mostly, if not all clover or dandelions, you need to um, decompact the soil, so you need to use core aeration. Number five is what? Everybody knows that one, dandelion. Dandelion has a very uh, deep tap root. So when you're trying to remove dandelion, it can be quite difficult, even if you have a root popper, to try to remove it. Uh, sometimes one of the most uh, easiest ways to get rid of dandelion is increase your mowing height, overseed, decrease compaction. If you have some that's still out there, uh, treat it in early October, uh, touch the surface of it with Roundup or 2,4-D, but only treat uh, those weeds, not the whole area. Next slide. The best way to reduce weed problems overall so that you can get away from the use of many of our pesticides is to encourage a health uh, dense turf. And this slide, the reason I showed this is because one side here 
uh, no control was done, there was extreme compaction, and you see it's mostly weeds. Um, whereas in the side where they did some coordination, the turf grass is actually coming back. Um, so we have to reduce compaction if we want to grow healthy turf grass. Also, uh, the best one of the other best ways to reduce weed problems is bring the mowing height up to three to three and a half inches. By mowing higher, many of our annual weeds simply won't get established uh, in the first place. And we also want to uh, recycle grass clippings. Uh, and in Joe Heckman's research over the years, he's actually shown that recycling grass clippings can reduce, if not uh, eliminate, many problems that we see within the landscape. All right, next slide. So here's our actions that we can take. Um, test the soil. And the way to do that is if it's your front lawn, I, as I said, go out uh, and take a cord down about six to eight inches um, and go to about 15 to 20 areas of an area we're calling our front lawn. Put that in a bucket, mix it all up, dry it down. And the reason you dry it down before you send the sample to the testing lab is we don't want it interacting in the plastic bag before we send it off to the lab. Make sure you properly mark the lab, uh, the bag so that you know the area of the landscape that you're testing. So if it's your front lawn or your black back lawn or where you have vegetables or uh, fruit trees or whatever, you know where that soil test is coming from and you wanna test each area of your landscape separately. So from each area, you get 10 to 15 cores, mix those up, dry that sample down. You just put it out in the sunlight to dry and spread it out over a tarp. It'll dry down within a matter of three or four hours. Then go ahead and send it off to the lab um, we want to reduce compaction in soil. So how do we do that? We do core aeration uh, in the fall is the best time to do it. Uh, another thing that we can do uh, at home is we can reduce the thatch to half inch. Uh, we want to do that in September. And by doing that, we reduce inoculum potential for disease. Um, we can reduce where insects will hide out in the turf grass um, thatch. Um, and it also helps nutrients and water and oxygen get down to the root systems. One way to really get many lawns to recover properly, if you're always having a problem with your lawn being thin, is for, do all the things we recommended with fertilizer and coloration. But one of the uh, really uh, beneficial things we can do is to overseed every two, three, or four years. Go in in, in, in uh, September and go ahead and use an overseeder in areas with uh, new varieties of turf grass, and it'll actually tell you the rate to set on there. So if you've got areas that are starting to thin out and you're starting to have problems, go ahead and overseed in September. Um, dwarf white clovers, it's a good idea to actually have white clovers in the lawn. Uh, we don't, we may not want the entire lawn to be white clover, but um, they will actually fix nitrogen for us. And if we want to add them, we can actually uh, buy the seed online. We only need about two to four ounces per thousand square foot, and it will fill in areas uh, where the soil is more compacted and help to break up those compacted areas and provide more nitrogen to the turf. We want to make sure we're setting our mower blades at three to three and a half inches. Um, and by doing that, we can actually uh, maintain healthier turf grass, um, maintain healthier roots. We want to recycle clippings back to the lawn because that adds anywhere from 30 to 50% nitrogen back to the lawn. Make sure we're irrigating early in the morning, uh, deeply and infrequently so we don't have shallow root systems on the grass. Um, we want to fertilize or add lime only based on our soil tests. So we want to make sure that we're properly testing the soil, getting those results back from the lab um, before we add any materials. And then if we're going to tr uh, uh, treat for weeds or for insect problems, make sure we spot treat uh, instead of blanketing the entire landscape with pesticides. And that way we'll cut back on overuse of pesticides and we'll have uh, better results because of it and we'll have less exposure uh, to children and pets from different pesticides. And it's a good idea to use biological controls whenever we can. We had mentioned the parasitic nematodes for grubs. And there's a lot of other things that if and also I would advise you to um, become a master gardener. So look in your county where there's a master gardener program. And we have many uh, scientists throughout the state, including myself and, and, and Michelle, and everybody on this team who actually teaches master gardeners throughout the state. Um, and I don't know if we have that other slide too, Michelle, for an event we're having this Thursday 
Yeah. Uh, we're going to actually be having um, uh, easy. It's part of our uh, Are You Ready to Garden series, but if you want to join us, uh, you just go to this link right here, and we're going to talk about seeding, transplants, and planting tips right from the Lubbock Greenhouse. So I'm going to actually be there um, talking about uh, all the different varieties that we recommend of vegetables that are easy to grow, uh, how to keep uh, the seeds and the transplants healthy and happy. We're going to give you some tips on planting. Uh, many people are turning to us now wanting to grow their own garden. So I'm going to give you some interesting plants that you can grow and talk about specific varieties of vegetables that will do well in our area and are easy to grow in pots. Uh, and if you've never gardened before, I'll give you some good ideas on, on how you can get started. Um, and we'll show you some great plants that we're growing. Um, so with that, um, and, and you can just, you have to type in this address into a tab on your browser in order to go there. You can register right at um, uh, WebEx by uh, go.rutgers.edu and then slash G3HACENV. That will automatically register you thanks to Michelle's guidance today. Um, that will automatically register you right on the site. Um, with that, are there any questions that I can take? Uh, yeah, there's there's a couple of questions, and there's also uh, some suggestions to suggestion to mention the plant sales. Plant sales? Okay, so there are um, uh, plants available all throughout the state uh, for you. Um, uh, many of our, uh, if you contact the master gardeners, they in, in each county they can actually provide you with people that are growing many of the plants that we're going to recommend. I'll talk a little bit more about that on this Thursday evening if you want to jump on there with this Thursday evening. Um, but there there are groups that are having plant sales and, and farmers that sell many of the plants that we recommend uh, at Rutgers University. Uh, you know, the great plants that we've always recommended, the Rutgers tomato, the Ramapo tomato, our new habanero pepper, uh, pumpkin habanero. Uh, there's some fascinating herbs and different plants that uh, we're, we're doing some testing on this year, actually, um, and we, we have some seeds available and some plants available at different locations, and we can let you know about that. Uh, you just need to contact us directly. Um, but there are some, as we said, we'll talk about Thursday night, but there's some, some varieties of vegetables that are much easier to grow than others, um, and we'll get into that more on Thursday night. Any questions on lawn care um, yeah. or anything else we've talked about that still hasn't been answered, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Sure, sure. So there's um, a question. Um, uh, can you fertilize without attracting squirrels? Um, yeah, so squirrels are hard to keep out of almost any area. They like to dig. So unless you have hungry cats in the area, um, it's kind of hard to control uh, squirrels. If you're keeping them out of vegetable gardens, you can use uh, things like chicken wire. Uh, actually, if if you go on the website, I did a video years ago for the Star Ledger where I showed how to build chicken wire cages around your regular tomato cages. But in where open areas where you're fertilizing, it's really difficult to keep squirrels out of those areas if they want to dig out there. Uh, you know, they're they're going to do it. It's kind of hard to keep them out of that area. Okay. So um, another question is uh, the. There's some questions. What what is the scientific name for white clover? And then also about what about red prairie clover? Is that okay? So when you go on a website, you would basically look for dwarf white clover species, and uh, they would be um, uh, the only kind of clover that I would recommend because I the other types of clover like Ladina clover, Alsike, or red clover. They're for production agriculture. They're not for front lawns. So if you Google and say um, Dutch white clover, and you look for dwarf varieties of Dutch white clover, that's really the only thing that you want to incorporate in your lawn. The other ones are going to be much too competitive. And we only use the other types of clover uh, for areas where we have animals grazing. Any other questions? Yes. Um, other questions, sorry, just going through the ones that we didn't get to here. Um, until uh, the soil testing lab is available, what, what would you suggest for, for uh, clients regarding soil testing? 
Okay, so if you didn't have a soil test and you have not applied any lime in the past, um, typically over time because of acidic fertilizers that we add and acid rain, we tend to get uh, acidic rain in this area. You could just add 50 pounds of limestone per thousand square foot um, as a general guide. And that was released recently from Joe Heckman, uh, just as a general guide. Uh, 50 pounds uh, of stannium calcium carbonate per thousand square foot. And that hopefully would bring you into the proper range, with, you know, without a soil test. But it's just a general guide. Um, if you can get your soil test anywhere, I'd recommend that you do that first. But the 50 pounds per thousand square foot is just a, it's, it's a right in the middle type of thing that if you have no other guide, you can just use that as a generic uh, guide. Okay. Any other questions? Lots, lots of questions from random, you know, random questions. Uh, what does uh, moss indicate and how should it be treated? Oh, okay, good, very good question. So moss comes into areas where we have, uh, it's more acidic, um, where we may have more compaction, soil doesn't drain well. Uh, and sometimes moss is one of the best things to, to actually grow in an area, unless you're going to put some other ground covers in there, because it could also mean that it's just not great conditions for turf grass. Um, but moss is also slippery and can cause other problems. So if you don't like moss, there are moss preventatives that can help to get rid of it. Uh, but in order to uh, eliminate moss, you have to have good sunlight penetration. You have to have good drainage. So it's not just a matter of going out and buying a moss preventer. You actually have to go out there you have to um, reduce compaction issues that are in the area. We have to have more sunlight coming in to that area. We want to adjust the pH up to the six to six five range. Um, we want to overseed with grasses that are going to adapt to those conditions. And mostly where moss is growing, it's probably going to be shade to, to um, partial shade to full shade. So if we want to grow grasses in those areas, we're going to use the fine fescues and we're going to overseed with fine fescues to help establish in those areas. Or simply just replace, dig out the moss that's there, mulch around the trees and shrubs with two inches of mulch, um, and then you don't have to worry about the moss. And it's okay. a good idea to mulch around trees and shrubs anyway, because uh, the mulch itself actually protects those root systems as we talked about earlier. Any other questions? Yeah, um, what is your feeling on Scott's lawn care products? Um, you know, I, I, as I mentioned before, um, it's not just a company. I don't support any one company over another. Um, basically, if you need to treat a problem, you treat the problem, but first you identify, like if you have a specific insect or disease problem within the lawn, identify what the problem is. Um, but it's, um, I can't recommend one company's product over another because they represent the university. Um, but I can tell you that if you do everything I'm talking about today with the right varieties and the right product and uh, at, at the right time, in other words, if you're using the right lawn varieties that we mentioned today and you're going to the NTEP website and selecting the right grass varieties, that goes a long way, uh, you know, and it doesn't matter where, you know, like the fertilizers, um, if you're using a slow release fertilizer, it doesn't matter what the company is, but you want to use it at the correct rate. Um, you never want to use more than 0.7 pounds of water-soluble fertilizer per 1,000 square foot. So it doesn't matter where that origin of that product is. Um, just, you know, follow the guidelines on the label. Um, and a company that you feel comfortable um, buying their products from. Okay. Um. Scott's products are fun. Uh, we will be putting this presentation, a lot of people are asking about the presentation. We will be putting this presentation um, online and share the, the uh, slides with, with you. So we'll look out for that in your email. Uh, just going through some of these questions here. Uh, there was a question earlier, uh, does using a riding mower contribute to soil compaction? Um, using a riding mower can, and, and you want to stay off of lawns when the soil is wet. Um, if it's been very moist outside, we've had a lot of rain, um, you want to avoid traffic on those lawns, you want to avoid riding mowers, um, and you'll notice that farmers as well stay off of the fields with their tractors, 
when the soil is wet because if you drive any heavy equipment or even you're walking back and forth all the time in areas where it's been wet, you will compact the soil. And what usually happens is right after you compact an area, weeds start to come in because weeds can be adapted to almost any condition. You know, there's a weed for almost every situation. So, um, yes, you want to avoid lunch tractors uh, in areas that are wet. But once the area is completely dry, you can go ahead and use your lawn tractor to mow the lawn. Okay. Any other? Um, yep. Um, how long do you have? It looks like we could be here all night. <laughs> um, well, um, you know, I just wanted to say that if people are interested in getting a lot more detail, become a master gardener in your county um, because we have wonderful programs in every county in the state of New Jersey. Um, and each one of these topics we cover in so much detail. If you want a little bit more detail in the Are You Ready to Garden series, depending on what the topic is, we will get into more of vegetable production and get into details of some of this that may be two or three hours long, but it depends on the topic. So if you sign up uh, and get in touch with us, we'll make sure that you get information. But this series, I would also attend the rest of the series here because this um, this is a great way for you to learn. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a kind of a, a, a short, encapsulation of longer based programs that it's almost like taking a semester of information and putting it into you know an hour um so and we have a lot of experts within extension um michelle and amy and mike and the whole group and sal they're all uh, very knowledgeable in, in in all these areas we're talking about in our whole team at extension uh, also when when things clear up and it gets nice uh, come out and visit us at the earth center uh, which is in Davidson Mill Pond Park in South Brunswick. Um, also, want to thank our freeholders for all the support that they give us because we wouldn't be there without the support from our Middlesex County freeholders. Uh, and that's important that we have support from Rutgers University, New Jersey Ag Experiment Station. And as uh, Michelle mentioned earlier, um, without that cooperation from all these entities, we wouldn't uh, have extension throughout New Jersey and throughout the United States. Um, any other last minute questions? We hope to see you on some of our upcoming training and, and next week you're doing another one of these next Monday, right, Michelle? Uh, yes. Next um, Monday? I, I also, we are, we are doing another one next Monday. Next Monday's uh, program will be on creating ha wildlife habitats from, from home. Um, and so definitely join us for, for that. I also wanted to let you guys know we are we are uh, providing these um, this series for for free, but um, if you would like to donate to our program, I'm putting in the chat box some information about how you can donate to our our program. You can donate to the Rutgers Environmental Steward uh, Program and funding for that uh, funding. Um, help support our extension volunteer efforts, including internships and scholarships and, and supplies. And we would ask that you just put, please put Earth Day in the notes when you are uh, donating. And we welcome any anything that you can you can do. And I just put in the chat the, the website to to give to the Environmental Stewards Program to help support this this series. And anybody that's interested in the uh, Are You Ready to Garden program too can contact us. Um, yeah, I'll send that information out uh, to yeah, appreciate the it. participants Thank you. so that they have that. And if you have questions online, we, we also have a helpline live uh, coming up this Wednesday. We can send out a link for that where um, we have three or four experts every Wednesday from uh, 11 to 12 p.m. that answer your questions live. So we can send out the link for that. Um, but I enjoyed all of your questions, and um, I think um, we had a wonderful session. And fortunately, the technology cooperated with this all. Yeah. Today. So, and Michelle, thank you. I have good engineers here, Michelle and Amy, <laughs> going thank smoothly. You thank you, Bill. Yep, I enjoyed speaking with everyone, and I hope to see you guys this Thursday.